Hey, did you just put off this entire humongous, gigantic proposal FBO and now you're confused, flabbergasted about what you should be doing? Don't worry, in today's video, we're going to talk about the different sections of an RFP on FBO or any other bid site that you may find and what things you should be looking for, what things you should not be looking for, so we can try and reduce your anxiety in putting this thing together, all right? Jump with me over to the big screen. We're going to get started right now. All right, today we're looking at the solicitation structure. This applies for the majority of solicitations. However, it's not a one size fits all solution, but for the majority of RFPs out there that you're gonna run across on FedBizOps or any of the other bid sites, when you're looking at uh, the actual solicitation itself, you wanna know how does the government actually break this thing down. So again, in today's lesson, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the breakdown of the solicitation structure. With that said, let's start off with part one, the actual schedule. So again, the solicitation is broken into four parts. The first part is called the schedule where you're gonna have sections A, B, C, D, E, um, and then we'll go on to sections F, G, and H. So again, um, section A is the actual solicitation, B, price and fee schedule, C, the scope of work, D, packaging and marketing, E, inspection, acceptance, F, deliverables and performance, G is your contract administration data, H, special contract requirements. Um, part two is gonna be your actual contract clauses. By the way, we're gonna to touch base on every single one of these parts in the latter part of the video. So don't worry, we're gonna go into them in great detail further on. Part three is your list of documents, attachments, exhibits. And part four, representation and certifications, uh, which talks about the instruction to offers, offers, the evaluation factors for award. So let's talk about part one, section A, the actual solicitation and contract form. This is the very first page that you're gonna see when you pull down one of these monstrous RFPs. When you look at the first page, it may actually include on there the actual solicitation. It may include on there uh, A through M. It may have on there, uh, it's gonna probably have on there the whoever the, the offer is, the agency. It'll have on there their name, their address, their contact information. It'll have on there a box for your information that you're gonna fill out. Uh, it'll have on there probably the signature page where you sign at, delivery location, the proposal due date, the set aside requirements, and things like that. Section B, um, typically in section B, what you find right after that first page, um, depending on if that page one lasts for two pages or three pages, how long it is, immediately following, you're gonna see section B, which is the price and fee schedule. Most of us are familiar with that because we go straight to, okay, what is it that the government wants to price? And what they do on uh, the government's particular, on the federal side is they put, call it what's called CLINs. So you'll see C-L-I-N, a CLIN number, and then you'll have, uh, for example, depending upon how the product or the project itself is broken down, you may have one, two, three, four CLIN numbers. You may have 10 CLIN numbers. You may have the project broken down by years. So there may be a base year to start with, which includes three cleans, and then each additional year, the price may escalate a little bit. So that's additional three cleans. So again, on section B is where you're gonna find the price and the fee schedule. You're gonna find a brief description of the actual supplies and the services along with that CLIN number. And it'll usually tell you they'll want the quantity in terms of units and then the price per unit, and then you add it together to give you a total, and then you sum that total for a number of CLINs. Here's an example of a very basic one where they're just asking on the schedule, it tells you what the description is for what the services are to provide and to give a price per CLIN number under this particular schedule. Uh, section C, uh, that's where they have the scope of work, descriptions, specs, things like that. If it's a small section, um, that doesn't require an attachment, then it will be included in here. If it's a larger spec section that's probably, I don't know, let's say 30, 40, 50 pages long, they may take and create a separate document and then just reference that, um, say reference attachment, C document. So this is where you're gonna find out exactly what is it that the government wants you to do, uh, what is it that they're looking for, and what is it that they want you to do, you'll find that here in section C. Here's an example. Um, that was actually included in a bid. So you'll see here, it's, it actually said section C, descriptions and specifications. And then it goes on talking about the contract term, um, it talks about the minimum value, estimate maximums, contract description. And this, this particular example, uh, it lasted about 30 pages or so. 
you know, this is great uh, because one of the things I wanted to point out that I know was confusing for me, and it may be for some other people out there, is when you're looking through this, they don't, it's like, for example, the, the spec section, the actual words are larger font than the description of the section. So be mindful of that when you're going through reading all this information. Be mindful that sometimes it's not going to just pop out like it's not bold or, or uh, all uppercase letters or underline. The actual section header is a smaller font <laughs> and it's less I would say uh, where it sticks out at you than the actual description of the work. So for me, I find that to be confusing sometimes. And I think for a lot of you guys out there, you may find when you're scrolling through all this stuff, you don't notice where the sections start and end. And so for, for uh, example purposes, this is a great example to show you how um, really amongst all of this other language is the title or the header of the section C description. And the other thing that I don't understand why the government doesn't do, why don't they make this like a separate page, right? So why don't they have a, like a start break page break like we do when we write papers, you'll have a page break, or you'll have like section C and then you'll start from a whole new, new section, you'll create it there. They just seem to have like run on uh, descriptions and then the, the sections will just kind of intertwine with previous sections. And if you're not careful, you won't even notice where they start and stop. Section D, um, packaging and marking, this is typically not used, um, um, but that's what it covers. But again, like I said, even the example that I pulled down, they didn't have a section D at all. Section E, inspection acceptance, very important section because it talks about the quality requirements, what they're gonna be looking for in order to approve your payment, right? So again, I equate inspection acceptance to money. So if you do not have um, meet the criteria of the inspection acceptance, then when they actually when your product's delivered, then the government's going to reject you and you can't get paid. So again, this is a important section, but not in the very beginning stages when you're analyzing the whether or not to to go make a go or no go on doing this RFP. This is not the section. This is only after you've determined that you want to bid the project. You want to make sure that. When you're negotiating a price with your suppliers, your vendors, uh, that they're going to be able to ensure that you uh, meet the, the minimum requirements in order for your product to be both inspected and accepted so that you guys can get paid. Um, here's an example here. Talks about notice of completion, task orders, tells you where they're gonna, the product's supposed to be delivered at, how it's going to be delivered, things like that. Section F, deliveries or performance. This talks about the place of performance, the period of performance, the time frame, any liquidated damages. If you don't know what liquidated damages are, that's when you are delaying the project. The government charges you a penalty. So that's where you actually are. If you Let's say, for example, you delay the project. The government may charge you $1,000 a day or $500 a day for delays and actual getting the product delivered. So that's liquidated damages. It tells you what triggers stop work orders. Um, and then it also tells you if the government happens to delay you, what are the implications of that and how do you recoup your loss, uh, time, money, efforts in terms of a government delay. Um, here's an example of section H. So it says here IDIQ, 12 month period, contract amount, um, and it tells you delivery performance and specified under each particular task order. It tells you how the work is supposed to commence. Section G, contract administration. This just talks about required accounting data. So, for example, uh, let's say uh, when you get the project, how are they going to pay you? How do you bill them? Um, what does that look like? It tells you, for example, if you're going to use wide air workflow, if you're going to do invoicing, if you can do credit card payments, what are the terms? Um, and that's what's talked about, particularly in section G. Um, here's an example of contract administration data. So it tells you the DFARs. Uh, and again, this section I don't really spend a lot of time on. Um, when I'm first analyzing a project. Section H, special contract requirements. This is, uh, for me, in construction, we don't typically have um, most stuff here that I have to pay attention to in the very beginning. But for you guys out there, you may have you may uh, run across this section where it talks about safety regulations, environmental protection, energy conservation, um, things like that. Insurance requirements is important, types of insurance, liability. But for the most part, if you're out here doing this kind of business, you should have all of the insurances necessary. But for those who are starting out and you want to know, this is a great way to assess your company, right? When we talk about, you know, the way the GovCon Giants model, when you're looking at building your team 
and actually getting the company ready to do business with the government, that is great information to know what types of things that you need to have in place, what are the requirements for the types of projects that you're looking to pursue. So again, that's one way to find out what do you need to be ready or eligible to participate in these solicitations. Section I contract clauses is where you see all of the FAR documents. So you see FAR references to the FAR, things of that nature. Again, most of that stuff is standard stuff. But if you have, I'll give you an example, if you have a product that's being imported from another country, you want to make sure that the clauses in here do not preclude you or exclude that country from being able to, on, on like on a do not buy list, say for example. So that would come into play into this particular section, contract clauses. Section J, list of attachments. For me, this is big because they have on there the Department of Labor Wage Determination also known as Davis-Bacon Wage Act. So for me, in this particular section, um, we have on there the Wage Act, which is how much we're supposed to pay the people who work on our job sites. So for, for, for that is very important in essence because we need to know if our subs, we need to make sure that our subcontractors get this particular wage rate so when they're doing their payroll and they're paying the people that they comply with the government's minimum standards. And so for me, Section J is important uh, documents that we hand out to our subcontractors. Section K, reps and certs, um, representations and certifications, also named reps and certs. I don't know, and again, don't get me wrong, I love you know federal government contracting, but I haven't figured out why is it that they continue to include this particular section in their projects. Reps and certs, um, and the majority of the examples, you'll see it, it's, it can be confusing because sometimes it's 20, 30 pages along, but it also, at the very beginning when you read clearly the instructions, it says, if you are registered in SAM, then there's no reason to include your reps and certs. So again, when you're reading through a proposal and you're getting ready to submit, make sure that you uh, you go through and you clearly understand what's the requirement for this, because sometimes, They'll tell you that it's not needed if you're already registered in SAM. I have seen one example where they said to include both your reps and certs and your SAM registration in the project. But for the most part, um, in most instances, I've found that if you're already registered in SAM, that you don't need to include this particular section. And, you know, I hate it because part of that, the whole thing of the package is it intimidates a lot of small businesses out there. So adding this type of fluff to a package intimidates a lot of small businesses. I can understand the premise from like say the 90s when there was no SAM system and companies or contractors were able to actually bid government projects just from a proposal standpoint. This made sense, but now that the new regulations call for all small businesses or all businesses and that fact to do business with the government to be registered inside a central database, I don't see the need to continue to include these sections and the proposals. But that's just my, you know, two cents. Section L, super, 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 super important. This is your instructions, conditions, and notices to offerers. So this is talking about how the government's going to determine uh, best value approach and bid submission. Um, it's also going to talk about your proposal and pre-bid conference. So the section L is extremely important. Um, and so is the next section, section M, evaluation factors for award. Whenever my team is gets one of these RFPs, pulls some anything down, right, and we're getting ready to bid it, these are the first two sections that we look at, L and M, period. We want to know, first of all, if there's an upcoming uh, bid, uh, if, we, if there's any upcoming uh, actual bid meetings that we can go out and see the project because um, if you would hate to pull down this thing, maybe you got it late, maybe you got it, maybe by the time you find out about it, it's a week has already passed. And so, the you know, if you don't go immediately to section L and determine when is the pre-bid or pre-proposal date, um, then you may have miss out on your only opportunity to go out there and see the actual site. So we jump immediately to sections L and M because we want to know, first of all, when is the pre-bid date? Uh, or pre-proposal date. And then the other thing that we want to know is what is the criteria that the government's going to use to determine um, whether or not someone or company is eligible to participate. And that is the most important factor when you're starting this thing out. Are you eligible? To, is your team eligible? Is your company eligible to participate? Do you meet the minimum requirements that the government's asking for in order to be deemed acceptable to submit a bid or proposal on this? Now, 
they're not gonna tell you whether or not you're acceptable, but they're gonna tell you how they rate the companies. And so if you're rating, if you can't score high on this, then it may be, you may decide to make this one a no-go um, and then pursue, spend your time doing another particular type of proposal. But what I find is people will go through, they'll go through this whole RFP thing, they'll start getting prices, and then at the very end, because this section is towards the very end, they'll realize that they were not eligible in the first place to actually even bid the job. So what I like to tell people is this, find out immediately if you have, for example, they say two years past performance of doing this task, right? They wanna show two years history. They may wanna show five jobs of experience. They may wanna show minimum job size or minimum project size of experience. Or if it's a historical, they may want to show you working at a historical place. If it's something, say, filming, they want to make sure you use these types of cameras, this type of equipment. If it's, uh, say, shredding, they want to make sure that you own or you have access to certain types of shredding machines that meet um, their minimum standards. So, again, you're going to have to demonstrate that your, your past history, someone on your team or a team member that you bring in can show this past history. So, again... In the very beginning, if you know this, this is helpful to determine, okay, we do we have this on our team? No. All right, do we want to bring in a subcontractor that has this requirement? Yes or no. Do we want to partner with another company in form of a teaming arrangement that may or may have this company? Yes or no. Do we have someone on our JV side that has this requirement? So again, and knowing this information up front is, is tremendously valuable for all of us out there because we will not spend a whole lot of time on putting together numbers and, and requesting bids from our subcontractors, our suppliers, or our vendors if we can't even meet these requirements. I want to tell all of you guys that I want to stress to everyone out there that make sure, make sure uh, this, you know, if you want to create anxiety and stress, then go through and try to read through the whole process and try and understand the whole thing for yourself without actually determining if you're even eligible. But again, the idea behind my videos and my training and my lessons and what I'm doing for everybody is like, I want to make this thing as easy as possible, as easy as it can be made possible, right? So let's break this thing down. So again, part of that process requires showing you how to skip through the all of the mundane tasks of, well, Eric, someone told me to read the whole package from cover to cover. You don't need to read the whole package at this stage. At the very initial stage, all you need to do is go to sections L and M to see if you qualify. If you don't qualify, make a determination if you're going to bring on someone who does qualify. If you say yes on that, now you go back and, and figure out, okay, now how do we start putting this thing together? But before that, there's no reason to read the whole package. There's no reason to read through a whole solicitation. It just doesn't even make any sense because we all have one thing that limits all of our, our lives, right? Is the same 24 hours in a day. So... You want to make sure that you are maximizing your time on things that are going to produce, you know, you're maximizing your efforts on things that are going to produce results. And this section L and M is a very highly productive use of your energy and time. So to recap, key elements of the solicitation section C, which is your performance work statement, section L, proposal instructions, M, evaluation criteria. Also, make sure you check out any other sections for requirements. A lot of times they'll have on their supplemental documents and the actual packages. And then because we're going to be talking about putting together proposals and upcoming videos, you want to make sure that your proposal, if you decide that you're going to do this, that the proposal outline follows exactly the letter of the law that they that they state in section M. So again, the valuation criteria, when you put together a proposal, they say A, B, C, D, E, make sure you write A, B, C, D, E. If they say one, two, three, four, five, make sure you write one, two, three, four, five. Treat them as if they're a bunch of robots. They're, if, they, if they don't see in there, they're the things that they're laid out, the exact format, the exact way that they explicitly state, then it, the chances are high that you're gonna be disqualified. Right. Or you're going to score really low in the ranking, which essentially makes you disqualified. Um, I love the federal government because it, they are, for the most part, explicit in stating how they want their proposals written, what information they want written in each section. And, you know, if you look at it from their standpoint, it allow, if they're evaluating 10 proposals, um, the fact that they are all uniform and consistent allows you to evaluate each one in an expedited manner. So do not 
stray away from the format that they explicitly state they want because it's going to make it harder or more difficult for them to read yours and so the chances that you're going to score highly in the ranking or approvals is going to be less likely because why you're not following the form outline that they conforming to the outline that they've actually explicitly stated in the requirement all right so again remember section m evaluation factors for award and section l instructions and conditions notice offers those sections are your friends when you get one of these things and you pull it down make sure you understand these two sections before you go any further thanks so much for watching hi guys listen welcome back we just went through about 15 minutes of how to take a look at the solicitation structure. I hope that this information is tremendously helpful for you guys out there. Um, for most people who have never seen a federal RFP, RFQ, this thing, I mean, it's overwhelming, right? And again, I know a lot of us are small businesses and we're just getting started. So I was hoping that I could make this introduction to the world of federal RFPs and RFQs a little bit easier for you guys out there and helping you to determine whether or not you want to proceed with pursuing this particular RFP or RFQ. Listen, as I stated in the video, sections L, section M's are instrumentally important. Hey, if you like that video, if you have anything else that you want me to produce, make sure to leave a comment below and we'll see you next time.